And I was mainly just going to focus on the management of uh, recurrent disease because I think this is an area that sort of uh, becomes important later on. You know, uh, just to give you your crash course on the skull base, you can imagine that the, uh, the brain sits on a bony floor called the skull base, and that's sort of like the first floor of your house. And uh, the reason why the skull base is an anatomically challenging area is because all the nerves and arteries enter and exit the brain through that first floor of the house. And when you look in terms of where chordomas begin, they begin in an area of that bony floor called the clivus. And the clivus has been one of the more challenging areas of the skull base to reach because all the nerves and the carotid artery sit on both sides of the clivus. And so when these tumors start, they're surrounded on both sides by nerves and arteries. And so, uh, you know, we know uh, from many, many studies that the, the expectation for a newly diagnosed patient is that the treatment consists of surgery to remove any parts of the invaded skull base and to remove any part of the tumor that has grown outside of the skull base, so through the lining around the envelope or into the nasal cavity. And ideally what we want is to provide an MRI scan that looks like this on the right side, where you, know, you don't see any evidence of residual disease and you have a patient who's better off after surgery in comparison to before surgery. And you know, as Dr. Uh, DeMonte alluded to, we've seen this tremendous uh, this growth uh, in skull base surgery. Uh, you know, because of the location of the clivus within the skull base, uh, you know, in the 90s, the, the challenge with surgery was to be able to access this area and to not only access the tumor, but to be able to remove as much of the tumor as safely as possible. And so we used to rely on facial incisions, we used to rely on moving parts of the face around, and also doing craniotomies from coming in front of the ear and behind the ear to access different parts of the tumor in order to remove as much of the tumor as safely as possible. And uh, what we've seen because of technology, the introduction of endoscopes, high resolution imaging, uh, the introduction of MRI scans that allow us to predict where uh, nerves are in relation to the tumor, the introduction of monitoring so we can monitor nerve function during surgery, what we can now do is use the nasal cavity as a corridor to get back to the clivus. And so the analogy is sort of working through the basement of the house to get to the first floor of the house. And this way we don't have to disrupt the brain, we can minimize sort of manipulation of nerves and arteries. And this has sort of been a big step in terms of improving uh, surgical outcomes for patients with chordoma. And when we look at our own experience from 93 to 2017 and seeing sort of the, this trend, when you look at endoscopic techniques versus the, the traditional open skull-based techniques, and there still is a role for some of those techniques, uh, using endoscopy as a first approach for most patients allows us to remove more of the tumor, reduce the number of operations that people get. Previously, patients would need you know, one, two, or three operations to get as much of the tumor out as safely as possible. With endoscopy, we're also seeing that we can get patients onto their next treatment, proton therapy, much faster. Before, with the older approaches, there usually was about a three-month lag before patients were ready to go on to radiation therapy. Now, with endoscopy, you know, at four to six weeks after surgery, patients, from our standpoint, are typically ready for radiation therapy. Uh, like I said, what I mainly want to focus on was on the management of recurrent disease, because I think this is a question that, you know, I think is practical uh, and that commonly we sort of uh, face with with our, uh, with our own patient population. And so the three questions I just wanted to answer is, first of all, you know, where can these skull-based chordomas recur? Uh, what are the best treatment options? And then, you know, how frequently and what type of scan should be done after a patient receives their initial treatment? And so I'm mainly going to use data from our own research and also the Cordoma Foundation to answer some of these questions. Uh, you know, as Dr. DeMonte mentioned, we've had a paper that came out this month, and the Cordoma Foundation also has a uh, best practices guideline to help sort of come up with the best strategies to manage the situation. So in terms of, you know, for a patient that's had their initial treatment, the question comes up, where can this tumor recur? And so you have two different types of what we call recur uh, recurrence or progression. And I'm going to use them interchangeably here. And so you have uh, on the left what we call local progression. So uh, these tumors can come back at the original site where they started within the skull base. And then you have what we call distant progression or metastases. Where, and uh, most commonly when they recur, they come back, uh, you know, if they occur systemically, we typically see them sort of in the spine. Uh, we can see in the lungs, and we can also see in the spinal fluid. And uh, when we look at sort of factors that we have to consider in terms of what treatment options, uh, what we have to consider, first of all, is the pattern progression. So has the tumor come back locally or distant? What previous treatments have patients had? We have some patients that have only had surgery without any radiation therapy. We've had some patients that had surgery plus proton therapy. And so those are important considerations that our data shows that we have to keep in mind. Now, in terms of the management of local progression, 
you know, given the uh, evolution in surgery with endoscopy, we're now able to access parts of the skull base that we previously weren't able to. We can access parts of the carotid artery, parts of the tumor around nerves responsible for eye movement. And so what we're seeing is patients who may have had their surgery at a time where endoscopy was not available. And their tumor is coming back in areas of the skull base that we're now able to access with endoscopy. And so this is an example of a patient uh, that had a tumor near the carotid artery and near the nerves responsible for eye movement. They previously had a craniotomy. Uh, they hadn't had radiation therapy yet, and they had presented to us with this tumor that was growing, sort of tucked away. And so this is a patient that we treated endoscopically. And so on the left side of the screen, you see the pre-op uh, scans, and on the right side of the screen, you see the post-op scans with no evidence of tumor around the carotid artery. And this is a patient then, considering that they had not yet received any radiation therapy, we then moved them on to proton therapy. And what our data shows is that for patients who have had surgery only, Doing repeat surgery again plus radiation therapy has a significant uh, advantage in terms of controlling that tumor. Mm -hmm. Now in situations where someone has already had surgery and has already had proton therapy, uh, what the data indicates is that surgery alone is not going to be the solution here, uh, but surgery does play a role in terms of getting somebody ready for an additional treatment option. And that additional treatment option really is uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. You know, as Dr. Groshans and Dr. Gia will talk about, there are different radiation modalities, okay? And when we talk about newly diagnosed patients, we talk about using proton therapy, which allows us to deliver high doses of radiation therapy spread over several weeks, and it allows us to minimize uh, that radiation exposure to the brain and the nerves. What stereotactic radiosurgery is, is a single-day radiation treatment that allows us to target a very small area and allows us to give an additional dose of radiation therapy. And so certainly we do not use this uh, for our newly diagnosed patients, but what our data shows is patients who present with local progression after they've had surgery and radiation ther proton therapy, using radiosurgery can be very effective. And so this is an example of a patient who, you know, about uh, four years after they had surgery and proton therapy, they had the small sort of recurrence within the skull base uh, near the carotid artery. And because of the location, uh, we felt that, you know, doing surgery again uh, would not be the safest here. And so then we treated them with a single day of uh, gamma knife radiosurgery. And this is the MRI scan up to two years later. And that treated site has completely disappeared. Now, on this, uh, in this same patient and on the same scan, they had another area that came up on the left side. And that also was treated with gamma knife radiosurgery. And you can see the scan is nearly... Uh, three years out, and that site's disappeared. And so when we look at our patients that we've treated in this setting where they've had surgery and they've already had proton therapy and we're using radiosurgery, what we're finding for local progression is that using gamma knife to treat each one of these areas, as a matter of fact, is really effective. Now, what's important to keep in mind is that we can use gamma knife to treat each one of these areas, but it's not going to prevent progression uh, from occurring elsewhere in the skull base or elsewhere in the body. And this is where, you know, it becomes important to having scans, the right types of scans on a regular basis. And, um, you know, we're also seeing sort of a similar trend in terms of management of distant progression. So if a tumor comes back in the spine, the metastases that we're seeing in the spine are the most responsive to treatment with radiosurgery. And so that has become sort of our preferred modality to treat patients who have tumors that have come back elsewhere in the spine. Now, as I mentioned, you can have other patterns of distant progression. You can see tumors come back in the lungs and in the spinal fluid. And this is really where we rely on our colleagues in medical oncology to use chemotherapy agents to help treat these patients because radiosurgery is not an option in that situation. And I imagine that sort of treatment paradigm is going to change as we see sort of clinical trials and new medications develop. And so. And this is an example of a patient here that had uh, a metastasis to the cervical spine that was treated with radiosurgery. And this is an MRI uh, two years after that treatment. You can see that it's just scar tissue there and the tumor is completely resolved. And so radiosurgery has become a very effective tool. It also uh, avoids perhaps a need for uh, a complicated operation with high risk. And so this is just as an important tool as surgery in terms of managing uh, local and distant progression. And so to summarize the last few slides, you know, the management of local progression uh, if you have not had radiation therapy, then we use surgery, again, plus proton therapy. If you have had surgery plus proton therapy, then that's where we really rely on radiosurgery, with or without surgery beforehand to help that. And then for distant progression, we really rely on radiosurgery for spine metastases. And I just want to finish up in terms of the importance of having scans on a regular basis. 
you know, I think we've all dealt with this in terms of, you know, dealing with insurance companies to get approval for scans. And when you look at the guidelines in terms of what types of scans you should get and what parts of the body should be scanned, there isn't any clear data out there. And so what we did is we looked at our experience. We looked at all our patients that we've treated. We looked at where the tumors came back, and we looked at the time course. And so based on that, what we've developed is sort of a, a scanning protocol. So you know, at certain time intervals, we get MRI scans of the, sc of the skull base, and at other time intervals, we get MRI scans of the spine and the CT scans of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And so the thought here is that if you can detect a recurrence early, it leaves the door open to many more treatment options. So the, the four take-home points, first of all, is the, the location of where the tumors come back and the previous treatments that a patient's received that really dictate what treatment options we're going to use for recurrence. Uh, repeat surgery, if it can be done safely, is an option, but it really is tailored to the situation. Stereotactic radiosurgery sort of become the main player in terms of how we manage local and distant progression. And then hopefully, as we see clinical trials develop and new medications develop, this whole treatment process is going to change, and hopefully we'll get more data for that. Thank you. Thank you.